Well, good afternoon, my neighbors and friends, and welcome once more to our Tuesday Confabs. What a pleasure to welcome you here at Al Monticello on Al Mountain on such a beautiful Tuesday afternoon. Uh, here with the sunshine and, uh, and the light winds. Uh, the subject that we will talk about today is, is most dear to my heart. And as I have said frequently, uh, it remains the most severe contest in which I have ever been engaged. I'm happy to welcome amongst us today our moderator, Mr. Brandon Dillard. And so without any further commentary from me uh, before the asking of the questions, I simply would like to ask, may I take a chair? Well, thank you. My pleasure. And uh, Mr. Dillard, if you will, the first question from our friends here today. One of your accomplishments for which you're known is as author of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom. But this statute is less well known than other things you've done. How did you come to law? You are asking me that I am known for being the author of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, and yet you say that uh, that it has become least known of much of what I have written. Uh, how did I come to write it, you ask? Well, Mr. Dillard and my friends, I'm sorry to hear that it is not as well known as our Declaration of American Independence, because I will tell you, next to the inalienable right of a people to uh, sever the ties with an old government and to form a new government is the inherent right of the freedom of the human mind. And that is what our statute of Virginia for religious freedom is securing, the liberty of the human mind. Now you ask me, how did I come to write it? Well, this was already in contest uh, for many decades, if you will, before I took up the pen. And I took up the pen to write a semblance of the statute beginning in 1777. But before that, uh, during the 1760s, I remember distinctly in the former colony of Virginia, the number of dissenters who were rising up in opposition uh, to being coerced by the Church of England to uh, ally themselves uh, with the ecclesiastical laws of the Church of England. You see, in the former colony of Virginia and the majority of our sister colonies, we were not only governed by the monarchy of Great Britain and her parliament, we were also governed by the Church of England. So no matter what your religious opinion, particularly if you were Baptist or Presbyterian or, or Methodist or Quaker or, or Catholic or Hebrew, oh, no, you had to attend the Church of England at least 12 Sundays a year, on the average one Sunday a month, and you had to pay a tax for the support of the ministers of Church of England and of the church itself. If you wanted to marry, you had to purchase a marriage license from the Church of England. Now, this might all sound somewhat startling at present, but rest you assured, it was nonetheless startling when I was a young man. So that, uh, that argument and that debate was first, first heard through those who were known as dissenters. Your next question, Mr. Dillard. So would you tell us a bit more about the dissenters? Uh, who were they? And why did many of the religious groups in Virginia who were not members of the Church of England support your bill? Asking me if I may explain a little bit more about the dissenters. Who, who were they? And did they play the important part? Well, yes, I, I can tell you that as a result of the number of petitions that were received by the old Virginia House of Burgesses uh, when the government was in Williamsburg, the Baptists were always at the forefront. And you recall that Roger Williams, of course, left Massachusetts in order to establish a colony on the premise of freedom for religion, that we know as Rhode Island. And so therefore, with the growing number of petitions, not only from the Baptists who were coming into Virginia, but the Quakers, let alone the Presbyterians, it was decided that a committee for religion be formed in the Virginia House of Burgesses. This was about the year uh, 1769. I'm happy to say I was on that committee. And so was Patrick Henry. Yes, believe it or not, he was on the committee for religion. And do you know, Henry and I worked together to support the Baptists and their inherent right to hold their religious opinion as they should choose. So very early on, these petitions were wont to refer to the 
furor amongst the people that they'd be granted the right to worship. In fact, I remember one petition, this was put forth on behalf of the Baptists, asking if they might allow their enslaved to worship with them in the evening and to invite their families to come worship with them as well. Oh my heavens. I remember someone on the committee, he would go unnamed, but he spoke up immediately and said, now if we allow the Baptists to worship whenever they choose, to invite anyone to worship with them, where will this end? Oh, you'll see the Presbyterians will follow, the Methodists will follow, the Swedenborgen, the Lutherans, the Quaker men. And what about the Hebrews, let alone the Catholics? Will they then want to vote? Oh, yes, citizens, I can tell you, I've not forgotten. The, the Hebrews and the Catholics were forbidden to vote in the former colony of Virginia. So you may understand, as startling as it is today, it was equally a concern when I was a young man. Uh, your next question, Mr. Dillon. You mentioned Patrick Henry. You traveled to France in 1784, the same year that Patrick Henry proposed an alternative to your bill, one that would grant a general assessment or tax for any Christian religious group of the taxpayers choosing. How is this proposal different from <laughs> yours? Mr. Dillard, I cannot help but remark on such a beautiful sunny day. Uh, my having merely mentioned the name Patrick Henry earlier has provoked you to ask further questions about his, um, well, his opposition to the statute of Virginia for religious freedom. And indeed he did a uh, turn to oppose that bill for a greater freedom for religion. But it was not until after I had sailed to France. You are absolutely correct. Yes, when I sailed to France the summer of 1784, by the end of that year, Patrick Henry wrote a bill of assessment. Now, this was to ask for a tax, a tax support to support teachers of the Christian religion here in the new Commonwealth of Virginia. So you can well understand that Henry's bill of assessment was no different than that to which we were accustomed before the war broke out, that we would still have to pay a tax to the support of one religion over others. Now I'm happy and thankful that my good friend James Madison immediately rose to the occasion to oppose Henry's Bill of Assessment and he wrote Memorial and Remonstrance, which squarely put Henry's Bill in its place to thwart any effort to make laws for the human mind and to prefer one religion over all others in an attempt to allow everyone to worship freely. Thank you, Mr. Dillard. Your, your next question. Well, you mentioned James Madison. Would you tell us a bit about your friendship? When did you meet? And why did you have similar views on religious tolerance? Oh, Mr. Dillard, you're asking me about my good friend, Jimmy Madison. Oh, I beg pardon for the informality, uh, Mr. James Madison. You ask me how long we have known one and the other when we first met and has he remained of great support? Well, I answer you first and foremost, as I have written often, he is the most luminous mind I've ever known, the mighty Madison. No one, in my opinion, knows more about ancient history, uh, what has gone right throughout the history of mankind, uh, what has gone wrong and man should never revisit again in making for a better government and for a greater liberty in his future. No, the mighty Madison was of great influence from the very beginning. And that beginning goes well back uh, some generations because you see, uh, Jimmy Madison's father, James Madison, the elder, uh, established a family plantation in Orange County. This was about at the same time uh, that my father, Colonel Peter Jefferson, had established our family plantation uh, here in Albemarle County. Now, though we are separated by one day's ride, by that I mean about 35 miles, I did not know of Mr. Madison until I returned to Williamsburg, Virginia, in the autumn of 1776, returning from Philadelphia, where, as you know, I had spent the previous spring in drafting our declaration and pursuing uh, the secession of our new nation from Great Britain. Mr. Madison had already been voted into the new Virginia House of Delegates. And so it was during that autumn of 1776, in particular between October and early December, 
that I witnessed the greatest, most intense argument and debate and uh, heated petitioning that I think I've ever known since over how are we going to continue with providing for religion in Virginia. Well, Mr. Madison allied with me. He was of the opinion that we no longer make it a civil authority to maintain the church, but to allow private subscription to ministers of one's choice and the formation of congregations uh, by those who choose to do so. So from the very beginning, Mr. Madison and I were well allied upon this subject. And later, as I mentioned, when I sailed to France, it was Madison who took up, if you will, that, uh, that noble and heroic effort to usher through the statute of Virginia for religious freedom, that being most successful in January of 1786. And thank you, Mr. Dillardin. Your next question. We have a question about your personal beliefs from Claudia. She wants to know, would you call yourself a deist? A deist? Well, Miss Claudia, and, uh, I will tell you, I, I have made it frequently known, I inquire of no one's religion, nor do I bother any with my own, because I believe a person's religion is solely between them and our Creator. Now, you ask me if I am deist. I believe in deism, though it is not a religion. Deism is a philosophy. It recognizes, if you will, a prime mover, the omnipotent power of the universe, the great architect of the universe. Now, some may suggest that it means uh, that our creator has um, created our universe and then left it. But, you know, the, the Quakers are want to satisfy us by saying God's work on earth must truly be our own. There is the divine in every creature and certainly no less in man. I'm of that opinion. And if that is deistical, so be it. It is the belief in God. And uh, we must remind ourselves, this supports religion. It, it does not denigrate it. Uh, it is the foundation of all lodges throughout the brotherhood of man across this globe. Thank you, Claudio. Uh, the next question. We talked about Mr. Madison. Bethany wants to know, did you know Mrs. Madison? <laughs> Bethany, you ask me if I know Mrs. Madison. Well, I will tell you, indeed, I have for some time, even before uh, she was introduced to, uh, to James Madison. I, I knew her as the wife of uh, John Todd in Philadelphia, though lamentably I cannot forget during that, uh, that summer of 1793, uh, Mr. John Todd, along with uh, his young son, uh, passed away due to the yellow fever epidemic. Oh, that was a terrible time in which we had to quarantine and sequestered ourselves, and yet our government had to go on. Uh, James Madison uh, was in town, and then later, uh, do you know, he was introduced to the widow Todd. I recall it was at a, um, it was at a tavern at Gray's Ferry, where you are about to cross the uh, Schuylkill River into Philadelphia to the east. And uh, there at the tavern, uh, the widow Todd was introduced to James Madison by Aaron Burr. Hmm. I should have been there. I might have warned her, but no. And, uh, and so within but a short time, they were married. And I will tell you, I have heard rarely of another union so happy and supportive, the one with the other. In fact, I welcomed them to visit here at Monticello many, many times. And I'm hopeful uh, that you may have the opportunity as you all come to visit uh, to talk with them and see them here, let alone to visit Montpelier, where they live in Orange County. Uh, thank you for that question. And the next one now. Did the statute consider the religious beliefs of enslaved people or American Indians? Oh, you're asking me a very good question, a very valid question. Uh, does the statute of Virginia uh, welcome and favor, protect and defend the religious opinions of the enslaved, let alone the natives of our land. Well, I can answer you, if you will, in somewhat of a legal sense. Um, yes, it does, though indirectly. And, and I say that because, um, well, as you know, the enslaved and the natives of this land are not, to my knowledge as yet, citizens of our country. But does the statute protect them in their inherent right 
to hold their opinion upon religion as they choose, to worship as they choose? Well, of course it does. I'm proud to say that Virginia was at the forefront for, for prescribing and enacting such a law that protects the liberty of the human mind, and no less to those now enslaved or to the natives of our land. Now, of course, the enslaved, as I have always known, continue to adhere to their old habits and customs in religion, which they brought with them uh, from the Africas. Uh, there are many who, yes, are Christian, but there are also those who have their own healers and also those who have their own spiritual leaders, and they have ever been free to attend to them and abide with them as they so choose. Thank you for that very, very uh, good question. Next question. What do you consider the greatest legacy of the statute? What do I consider the greatest legacy of our statute of Virginia for religious freedom? Well, I think I've mentioned it uh, already several times. Uh, and that is to maintain, protect, and defend the liberty of the human mind. I had mentioned earlier that the great contest over the freedom for religion was between those of the old-fashioned opinion that we must continue to maintain the church, that that was a duty of civil government. Well, they were naturally opposed by those who believed it must be a personal subscription and to be followed by those who gather together uh, in the name of our Creator and our Lord as they choose to. Uh, as that was the contest, we reminded ourselves then and we must never forget. It is not the purpose of government to pronounce religious opinion, to establish laws for the human mind. The only duty of government and its laws is simply to protect us from injury by one and the other, otherwise to leave us free to pursue our own industry and our own improvement. And will not our improvement be the more successful when we are all free to worship as we choose and therefore more free to do good? You know, I wrote in notes on the state of Virginia, <laughs> whether an individual worships one God or 20 gods or no God, neither breaks my leg nor picks my pocket. Your next question. Missy wants to know how you view the statute's impact on religious freedom in the Constitution. Oh, Missy, what a very, very good question. How does our statute of Virginia uh, influence, if you will, the First Amendment and, uh, and other uh, uh, particular paragraphs or articles in our Constitution. Well, I'd like to think that it, it influences uh, our Constitution greatly. I can tell you this, that as soon as uh, the Kingdom of France and European kingdoms learned about the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom as it was printed and made its way to Europe in the spring of 1786, they were astounded that we had been able to achieve such a liberty for the human mind when they had been beholden, if you will, to the alliance of, of church and state for so many generations and, and centuries. So I think that, uh, that about a year later, yes, it was the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia uh, that uh, September 1787, when they started to consider how we would be associated with religion, well then happily, happily I believe it is um, uh, Article 3, it is Paragraph 3, that it states boldly there will be no religious test for office. Now, I mentioned that first before I referred to our First Amendment, because if you remember, the Bill of Rights uh, came afterwards as an amendment to our Constitution to secure our Constitution in the hands of the people. And therefore, as we have been talking already, that First Amendment secures that inherent right to hold our religious opinion to ourselves, that Congress will make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So I'd like to think that our statute uh, a year before uh, that Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia uh, was of interest. Your next question, please. Heidi is curious what church you attend and how far it is from Monticello. Well, Heidi, that's a very good question. I have not been asked that question often, and I certainly welcome it. You're asking me, uh, what church do I attend and how far is it? Uh, from Monticello. Well, I was uh, brought up in the Church of England. 
uh, where I was born at Shadwell Farm. My father, Colonel Peter Jefferson, was a vestryman uh, of the Church of England. And he attended to St. Anne's Parish as a vestryman his entire life. Now, at the time, the church to which we attended uh, was in Scottsville, as it's now referred to. And that's a good 20 miles uh, south of uh, our little mountain here. So as I was growing up and baptized in the Church of England as well, I would then attend a church uh, in Scottsville. Uh, and I was as well invited upon the vestry of St. Anne's Parish, and I remained so. Now, would that we could have a church here in Charlottesville. Unfortunately, uh, we do not as yet, although I am designing one. I'm hopeful we will have one uh, someday. Uh, it will be um, of the American Episcopal Church, and I have helped uh, to form that particular church here in the new Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, but at present, Heidi, I'm afraid that uh, all various uh, religious sects, free to worship as they choose here in Charlottesville, uh, meet in one and the other's parlors or even uh, tobacco barns. Uh, so I certainly try to attend to religious service uh, wherever I, I can. Very good question. Thank you. And the next question, please. All right, one final question, Mr. Jefferson. You have written that the intent of the statute when adopted by Virginia was meant to protect not only Christian religious practice, but also non-Christian religious beliefs, or even no religious beliefs. Why do you believe that's true? You ask me, I have written that uh, the statute of Virginia protects uh, all religions, or protects uh, even those who may not hold an opinion on religion, and yes, it certainly does. I will tell you, though I was not here, I remember that when uh, the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom was engaged in its last contest in the Virginia House uh, uh, Delegates, uh, that was um, October uh, through November and December 1785, uh, there was an interest to change the, the preamble if you will, to insert, rather than our creator has created the mind free, uh, a referral to Article 16 of the Virginia Declaration of Rights. Uh, and I believe that was written by Patrick Henry. And it stated distinctly that uh, we should bear with Christian forbearance. And I think there was even an effort to insert uh, Jesus Christ. Now, I am not opposed to Christianity or the teachings of, of our Savior, but I will tell you this that it just completely ignored the religious opinions of others. And so therefore, happily, again due to Mr. Madison, uh, that suggested preamble uh, lost. And so there is no uh, referral at the beginning of the statute or throughout to one particular religious opinion over all others. So yes, if you will, I am still bold to say, uh, our statute protects the Jew, the Gentile, the Hindu, the Mohammed, it protects the infidel. My motto has always been rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. And therefore, for any government to compel an individual to furnish contributions of money to one particular religious opinion that they disbelieve or abhor, it is sinful and tyrannical, and I am opposed to it. I thank you for this opportunity that we can continue to visit so freely this subject of freedom for religion. I have always said, wherever there is freedom for religion, you will see the greatest civilizing of man. And why not? Is not religion something that helps us, supports us to do good? I look forward to the time when we are together again here on our mountain. And uh, I hope as well that day will be soon when we can walk together about our gardens here and enjoy, if you will, that scene, my ocean view of the gentle undulation of the treetops to the southeast and in the opposite direction, the beauty of the Blue Ridge Mountains. So for the nonce, I, I bid you au revoir rather than adieu because au revoir in French means until we meet again. I remain your humble and obedient servant, Thomas Jefferson. Godspeed.